All right. Hey, thanks everybody for, for joining us today. We're excited to get to talk uh, about some of the uses of Istio beyond Kubernetes. You know, kind of since the, the project came out, uh, it has, has kind of always been tied to Kubernetes, at least in, in people's minds. And, uh, but that's not actually the case in production, right? Uh, and what's more, most of our production footprints uh, are not only Kubernetes, right? And so there's a, a real need for, uh, the, for taking the service mesh beyond uh, just Kubernetes itself. And today I'm really excited. We have a, a phenomenal crew here to kind of talk through some of how we do that and how we've seen that hands-on. Uh, so hey, to start with, I'm Zach. Uh, I was uh, one of the founding engineers at Tetrate and I was one of the earliest uh, engineers on Istio at Google. Um, I'm Pratima Nambiar. I lead the teams that build and operate um, the Mesh platform at Salesforce. And I'm Sven. I'm uh, one of the founders of Istio, and I've been uh, pushing for us to support things beyond Kubernetes since day one. <laughs> so I'm really excited about this. Yep. Uh, awesome. And, and so today, uh, I'm going to start off, and I'm going to talk about uh, some patterns that, that we've seen uh, for taking Istio beyond Kubernetes. Uh, for These actually come out of kind of two customers that I've worked with very closely uh, to, to help achieve these uh, deployments in production. And then after that, we'll dive into to kind of two more excellent uh, case studies uh, from both Salesforce and, and Google uh, that really are, are applying a very similar set of patterns uh, here. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, and, and the first kind of pattern that, that we'll talk about or the, or the first use case is this idea of split Kubernetes and VMs, right? Uh, and, and maybe this is all in one cloud provider. Uh, you know, so you're doing like EKS and EC2 or, or GKE and GCE. Um, or possibly you're on-prem, right? And this is your vSphere footprint plus, you know, like OpenShift that you're running uh, uh, locally, right? But the particular customer ca that I worked with through, through this uh, scenario of, of bridging EKS and, and EC2 environments kind of took this migrate then modernize strategy of, hey, let's get everything into cloud so we can shut down the data center. And then we're gonna work incrementally within our applications to modernize them piece by piece, right? And as they were looking at this problem set for them, there were these four primary use cases that rose to the top, right? So number one was encryption and transit. Uh, they're a financial services company. They're heavily regulated uh, because of, of things like PCI DSS. Uh, all data must be encrypted in transit. Um, the, that was kind of the first key thing that they wanted. As a corollary to that, they additionally wanted consistent access policy based on those runtime identities. Those two kind of go hand in hand, really. Beyond that, they needed fine grained load balancing. And I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit. And then one of the other big use cases, and this is one that I see all the time uh, in, in this idea of kind of bridging heterogeneous environments, is controlling how traffic flows to, for example, the legacy uh, uh, monolith and the newer microservices that are being decomposed out of that monolith. Uh, and so if we look here at this at this picture to start with, you know, maybe we have EKS and EC2. Uh, the one of the important kind of underpinnings here is that we have a common certificate authority. Uh, and, and this will be a pretty common, uh, I think, trend across all three of ours. Uh, we need that common TA to facilitate communication, right? Um, and so that'll live somewhere kind of outside the mesh. In general, I would recommend strongly that you root your mesh's root of trust in your existing PKI. And we're gonna have an Istio deployed and it is gonna be, and it's gonna manage kind of all the envoys nearby. Uh, in this case, you know, maybe this is a single AZ, uh, for example. And so we can, those EC2 instances are close enough to that Istio uh, that they're gonna have roughly a shared fate. We wanna align our failure domains here, right? Uh, and Istio is going to program everything like normal, um, with the exception of some service discovery information we'll dig into a little bit here. And so now what I want to kind of start to pick through here is how a deployment like this starts to facilitate traffic flow and achieve kind of some of these four needs. So first and foremost, we should talk about, you know, the, the, the easiest case, which is how do we get traffic from existing applications into the new system, into Kubernetes, for instance. And that's a, a bog standard uh, Kubernetes ingress use case. Uh, and, and, you know, you'll go in through, through a gateway uh, and that gateway can have, you know, an assigned static IP address, a DNS name, whatever it needs. But much more interesting is then how we start to facilitate communication into the, the non-Kubernetes environments. 
And so the first and, and easiest that I'll call out is this ability to just go in through a front door Envoy. Uh, and this is super easy to facilitate. That Envoy can have you know, a static DNS name, a static IP address, for example. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to execute service discovery on it. But you do get some of the nice kind of control that Envoy gives as traffic flows into these VMs. And in particular, one of the big things that this lets us do is split traffic as we're, for example, decomposing that application that's that's on a VM. And as we split that traffic, you know, that can go to different places. That can go maybe to a different cluster. Maybe that can go all the way to a different site or a different region. And this is one of the things I, that we'll kind of talk about as we circle back at the end. But Istio gives us this, this set of tools for solving problems uh, and we can reuse them uh, to solve many similar problems. So controlling traffic split across, for example, a VM deployment and a Kubernetes deployment looks very similar to controlling traffic across, uh, for example, sites as failing over for, for disaster recovery. Uh, and so this is, this is one way, hey, you know, we can go in through these front envoys, uh, but there's other ways that we can start to wire this up. And how you ultimately choose to, to use the tools that Istio provides is gonna depend on your site. And so for this particular customer that I worked with, they actually had an existing legacy service discovery system. Uh, it was based on, on Zookeeper. Uh, I think actually we'll hear about Salesforce and then they have the home, a very similar system. Uh, it was in vogue at the time that both of those companies were built. And uh, their applications automatic on VMs automatically registered with that service discovery system. Uh, for them, it was important that we didn't have these extra network hops because the, the overall latency of the, of the transaction was pretty important. And so they wanted to facilitate direct VM communication. And we were able to do that in a pretty straightforward way uh, by taking their existing kind of uh, Zookeeper service discovery records and translating those into services, into service entries for Istio in a, in a pretty natural way. Um, and I'll point out, you know, we had to do this kind of bespoke in their sites because they had uh, a homegrown service discovery system. As you're starting to use like different cloud providers uh, that, are, that are starting to provide different service discovery mechanisms, uh, chances are pretty decent that there are already some integrations around, right? So for example, uh, EC2 uh, populates a cloud map registry uh, for service discovery and, and Istio, uh, there are plugins, for example, to, to push that data into Istio. So this isn't necessarily something you have to build yourself. Uh, but this is uh, a totally valid way to set things up. And, and one that we see a lot, uh, we have folks running in production doing you know, direct pod to VM connectivity uh, in, this, in this way. And then of course, for, for VMs that we might actually enroll into the mesh, and when I say enroll into the mesh, what I mean is deploy a sidecar there. And that's another important idea I want people to understand. You don't necessarily have to have a sidecar deployed there. It'll de change your security model. Uh, but you can get some benefits from just having kind of this, this uh, doorway, Istio ingress gateway as well. Um, but when we do have an Envoy on that VM, we can use some of Istio's new auto registration capabilities. Uh, I think some of them will talk about that later uh, to, to know exactly where that, that VM is, where it lives uh, in Istio and enable that direct communication without having to do the kind of lifecycle events off to the side. And so, you know, looking at these, we can, there's, you know, some easy ways that we can facilitate traffic flow. We might pick different ones based on our requirements. Uh, and they give us these other capabilities. For example, uh, fine grain load balancing. In this particular customer site, fine grain load balancing let them drop their Kafka footprint by, to one sixth of its original size uh, because they weren't doing this at connection level. So there's some big benefits there that you can get putting in some of the envoys for the for the, the load balancing and then facilitating some of this connectivity. And now I kind of want to take a step back uh, to, to one higher level, which is what if we need to start to do similar things across sites, right? Uh, and, and the particular customer that I have in mind here, uh, Square, has to do this. They have legacy data centers uh, where they run uh, applications and they run those in a mix of, of VMs and uh, and Kubernetes as well. Uh, and they have a, a cloud uh, footprint too. Um, and their first two requirements were identically the same. I need encryption in transit, I need consistent access policy. Again, they're a financial services company, it's, it's incredibly important. Uh, but then they, and, and they had that same Kubernetes to VM within a single site, right? That right side picture is, is identical to before. Um, however, they had the additional requirement that they needed to be able to fail across sites. Uh, for example, for, for disaster recovery. 
as well as uh, the need to, to burst into cloud for additional compute capacity. Uh, for, for them, they have very uh, you know, time of day driven traffic patterns, for example, uh, and the need to, and, and so you know, for, for uh, certain events like market open, market close, those kinds of things, uh, there's a lot more traffic. And so the ability to burst uh, into and not run over provisioned all the time is, is absolutely massive. And if we look, you know, uh, I'll take kind of that, that first example we have, you know, we have, or, or I'll take one of the examples I dove into before, where we have traffic coming in and we want to control how that flows across, for example, a, a VM and a, a Kubernetes cluster. By the same token, we can control how we flow across sites. And if we squint uh, and look, you know, these two patterns are, are the same. They're, they're, uh, the, doing the same things, they're, they're achieving very similar goals as well. Um, and so I want to kind of highlight that Istio gives us a set of tools around how we can load balance. Uh, and, and when I say the same, let me, let me dig into that for a minute. As an application running on this, this in the mesh, I get to communicate with my dependencies using a name and really not dealing with anything else. Uh, and the mesh is going to deliver that. And so when I say this is the same, how the application perceives or, or connects with other applications is identical uh, throughout. And so, you know, and, and we're doing similar functionality at similar places, even. This is an important idea because, again, Istio gives us this set of tools that we use for solving the problems. And so it's important that we internalize kind of what those fundamental tools are because we can use them. And so in this case, having that ingress gateway that can, that can load balance across multiple clusters is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, but there is one other large uh, problem that I kind of skipped over earlier that, that is introduced now that we have multiple SDODs here, which is uh, we need to, to start to coordinate our configuration in the system uh, and synchronize that. Um, and that's a, that's a problem that Istio itself does not solve natively today. There are some different deployment topologies you can use with less SDODs here, for example, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, but regardless of, of which deployment topology you pick, you are going to have to solve how you start to synchronize configuration across different clusters. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different options there. Uh, I think Sven will talk about some at, at length in a, in, uh, or, or in a little bit more depth in his section. Uh, but the general rule is, you know, use a, a CD cluster, uh, your, your existing CD system to, to start to facilitate that. Um, and with that, you know, and, and so these are kind of two concrete customer patterns that, that I have personally seen firsthand uh, to, to start to facilitate communication across these disparate environments. Um, and with that, I think we'll, we'll now kind of dig into uh, some other examples that, that use that are, that are very, very similar, I think. Thank you, Zach. Um, if you can move on to the next slide. Oh, yeah, um, sorry. yeah. Salesforce um, service mesh spans multiple, um, well, service, uh, spans services that run on diverse infrastructure. Um, for example, in our first party data centers, we support services that run on bare metal, communicating with services running on Kubernetes. Um, our monolith runs on bare metal in first party. Um, in our public cloud deployments, we have services running on VMs and Kubernetes talking to each other um, via mesh. Um, about four years ago, when we built our mesh platform using Envoy and our in-house control plane, uh, we had to support these services um, running on these diverse infrastructure. And therefore, when we wanted to adopt a open source uh, product as our control plane a couple of years ago, um, the min minimum viable solution had to support bare metal VMs and Kubernetes. So we chose Istio since it is a feature-rich control plane and that it, it meets our um, growing requirements and it is solving the problems that we are trying to solve and therefore is a good fit um, for Salesforce. Um, let's take a closer look at what our mesh platform with Istio as our control plane looks like. Um, we run Istio D on Kubernetes, uh, which is the control plane, um, and Kubernetes services inject um, sidecar and communicate with the control plane for config updates and policy updates. We have a config webhook that generates some Istio config for our services. Um, and um, Salesforce requires us to use an internal CA for short-lived certificates. So we configure both our control plane and our sidecar to use these certificates um, generated by our internal CA for MTLS. Um, we run our sidecar next to um, our monolith 
on bare metal, and it communicates with the control plane via a L4 um, load balancer. Um, the monolith announces to Zookeeper, so Zookeeper is our service registry for non-Kubernetes workloads, and then we have a synchronization service that synchronizes these announcements in Zookeeper and updates service entry objects in Kubernetes. Um, the service entry object is similar to a Kubernetes service object, and it is used to represent a service um, that can participate in the mesh. Let's take a closer look to, at how to onboard a service that's running on bare metal onto Istio-based mesh. Um, we manage the life cycle of the Istio proxy sidecar um, by the monolith, so the monolith does that for us. Um, the Istio proxy is, as I've mentioned before, configured to use certificates that are delivered by that same internal CA. And the service routes um, traffic um, to a special IP to participate in the mesh. And we have a DNS, a wildcard DNS, that results to the special IP, and it is used to reference all mesh services um, in, in the mesh. Um, we also configure a sidecar resource. It is a custom CRD that's available, um, that's provided to us by Istio. And we configure ingress and egress listeners at that special IP um, via that sidecar resource. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, the monolith announces to Zookeeper, and that gets synchronized um, uh, to Kubernetes as service entry objects. And that is how um, our bare metal service is able to participate in the mesh as if it were running on Kubernetes. Um, your next slide. Yeah, we are in the process of rolling out a new feature that was introduced in um, Istio 1.8, and this is the auto registration feature. Um, adopting this feature will allow us to get rid of that zookeeper that we use for service registry for non-Kubernetes workloads. Um, the auto registration feature of Istio supports a set of CRDs to represent non-Kubernetes workloads to enable them to participate in the mesh. Um, for example, there is a um, workload group um, CRD that enables you to specify the properties of a workload for bootstrapping it and as a template for workload entries. It's kind of similar to how you, um, you can use a deployment object in Kubernetes to define the properties of workloads uh, via a pod spec. Um, a workload entry um, CRD represents a single workload similar to a pod in Kubernetes. And, and I, as I mentioned before, the service entry is similar to a Kubernetes service object for non-Kubernetes workloads. So in our deployments, we create the workload group um, with the workload entry template. Um, we we pre-create it. And the um, Istio proxy that runs next to our monolith on bare metal or a service on VM um, connects to the control plane and the control plane auto registers and creates that workload entry um, object that we talked about, um, uh, similar to how a pod is created in Kubernetes. Um, and then you can choose to create, pre-create the service entry object, uh, but we create that service entry object via a config uh, webhook, which listens for those workload entries, so we don't have to pre-create it. Um, and that is kind of how we um, hope to adopt. The, we're, we're in the process of adopting the auto registration feature so that we can get rid of that zookeeper um, that we run today. Everything I said so far also holds good for VMs. And VM for VM-based services, we deploy the proxy using RPM. Um, Istio 1.8 also supports a DNS proxy feature. Um, at the sidecar. So adopting that feature will allow us to remove that special IP and DNS that I talked about earlier to, represent, to refer to mesh services. Um, the sidecar can be used to resolve DNS entries of any mesh service. For example, a non-Kubernetes workload can refer to a Kubernetes workload with the Kubernetes DNS name. Uh, we use this feature today to resolve services running on different uh, Kubernetes clusters as part of our multi-cluster mesh support, and we will be using that for non-Kubernetes workloads as well. I hope that gives you a feel for how Istio is being used to support services running on diverse infrastructure at Salesforce. 
I will now hand it off to Sven to talk about how Google uses Istio beyond Kubernetes. All right, thank you, uh, Pratima, and thanks, Zach, for the, the introduction there. Um, so I'm going to just really briefly touch on actually a lot of the same kind of stuff. Um, you'll see a lot of similar patterns here. Um, just like just like Salesforce, Google is running uh, services in on-prem data centers as well as in cloud. Um, the the group I'm going to talk about here really is Google's internal corporate um, engineering team that builds and runs a lot of our internal services. Um, I think one of the, the the fun ones that actually they were starting with here is a system that provides uh, menus of the cafes. It's not been very useful the uh, past year, but um, that was a great app way before all of this uh, pandemic stuff happened. Um, so we run applications, uh, these corporate applications, both on cloud and on-prem. Um, and in both cases, we're using the service mesh for kind of all the stuff that everyone uses service mesh for, right? So the micro segmentation of the application layer, so you don't need to do uh, network firewalls, um, operations management, uh, the encryption requirements you know, that Zach was talking about for financials, uh, Google has the same sort of encryption requirements on everything. Um, and on just making releases easier to roll out and safe, right, using the Canary support. So those are kind of the main use cases. Um, so within those, let's look at uh, the, the applications running on Google Cloud Platform. Um, so this is a mix, actually, of internally written applications and also uh, vendor applications provided by um, vendors that Google works with. And the interesting thing there is that the, because of the way Istio works, you can actually just take those vendor applications and run Istio on them without having, you know, having to have the source or anything, and that's actually a huge benefit. Um, so you can you can get all these controls without having the source. Um, and again, this is a mix of of VMs and containers and serverless. Um, we kind of use everything, and we want them all to be able to talk to each other and to talk to the services running either on prem or actually in our production environment. Um, so we sort of need everything to be able to talk to everything, and, and Istio is a big help there. So for our, our on-prem environment, um, we have basically the same stuff, actually. So we have you know, this mix of vendor applications and custom-built internal applications. Um, here, actually, it's mostly VMs for on-prem. There's not yet a lot of uh, container usage. We are starting to experiment with uh, Google's Anthos product um, to provide on-prem Kubernetes and then get um, containers there. But right now, it's pretty much just VMs. And uh, for these on-prem data centers, we actually connect both to Google Cloud and to the production services kind of through the front doors of those services. So there's no there's no back doors here. Everything goes in as if it was you know anyone else. All right. Um, so let's uh, let's take a look at what this actually looks like. Again, this is kind of at a at a at a high level here. Um, so Zach was talking about the the configuration distribution problem. Um, so we actually already have a whole system in place for this that is set up to distribute sort of a lot of that lower level networking um, configuration, things like the the um, network ACLs and, and firewalls and other policies on projects and things like that. Um, we're just reusing that system and you know adding a plugin to support sending out the um, the Istio policies. So that is how we distribute all of our policies to um, to all the API servers. And that actually provides a sort of um, paper trail, if you will, from source control all the way to the end state. Um, so no user is directly modifying anything in an API server, right? They're submitting things to our internal repository. Those changes are then vetted and then rolled out um, carefully to the entire fleet. And it makes it a lot safer. And you, know, you have your audit trail and all that kind of stuff. Um, we, we're actually running Istio D here as a separate external service using the support um, that was added for external Istio D. Forget if that was in 1.7 or 1.8, but um, it's available now, and actually we're taking advantage of it. Um, this lets you run an Istio D that is not actually in any cluster. You can run it, uh, you know, however you want. You can run it on VM. You can run it in a separate cluster that you manage. Um, you can run it in serverless ways, right? There's lots of opportunity um, to manage it. Without having, you know, the people that are running applications having to worry about this duty and and care about it and, and feed it, um, so we run that and that is hooked up to read from the various API servers um, in the in the mesh. Uh, we are using auto registration that Pertina talk, talked about. Um, so the VMs they're running sidecars. 
um, those head cars auto register. We automatically create the workload groups um, for those based on the the um, configuration stored in the policy manager, and so you know the whole system just kind of works and everything can talk to each other. Um, the VM VM envoys and the pod envoys all just connect to manage envoy. They get their configuration, and you know everything just works. So it's great. Um, so that's that's a quick rundown of of how uh, Google is using Istio internally. Cool, awesome, thank y'all. Uh, so just to kind of to come back and, and summarize, right? If if we look through and, and look at like some of the high level topologies here that, that we kind of talk through across these four use cases, and we squint, you know, fundamentally we're we're really solving the same set of problems here, right? This this cross cluster cross site connectivity, and Istio gives us this really powerful set of tools. We saw across these disparate organizations, we weren't actually working particularly closely together, any of the three of us around the development of these separate systems, right? Uh, but all of us converged at, at architectures that are, that are you know, very similar, right? And, and even some of the lower level trade-offs, for example, that Prenima went over uh, and, and how you know, Envoys connect and those things are, are exactly things that, that we've seen firsthand, that I've seen firsthand yeah, Sven, I think you've seen similar things as well. And, you know, and, and that for, you know, so as a group of folks that are also helping build these tools, that's incredible. That's awesome and exciting because it says, hey, our tools are, are actually solving some problems. Um, and, and you know, their Istio today gives us this powerful vocabulary, gives us these powerful set of tools for, for solving these, these problems. Um, you know, there's maybe just a little bit of roughness around wiring it up at the edges, and there and there's trade-offs that you're going to want to make in the context of your particular deployment and the security posture that, that you need to maintain, and, and all of those things. There's no one size fits all, uh, but the the primitives are there, uh, and they're powerful, they're robust, and they're and they're tested to be able to go do this yourself. And with that, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Any any closing comments, uh, Prima Spin, that, that y'all want to make? I, I'll echo what you said, Zach. That the like seeing other people use this stuff just you know makes me so so incredibly it's... happy and proud, right? Of, of just uh, and especially like you know I, I worked I worked a lot on figuring out uh, workload group and workload entry and auto registration and like making that all work. And it's, so it's so exciting to see someone say, yeah, you know, we're starting to adopt it and it's going to solve problems for us, right? Because that's what we're here for. We're here to help solve problems. So super exciting. Um, I, I think you guys summarized it well, I, I, and um, we do feel like we've made the right choice as we adopted um, Istio as a control plane uh, for Salesforce. Um, yeah, uh, that's all I have to say. Great. All right, Thanks awesome. Everybody. Thank you all. We look forward to, to questions. Uh, everybody have a good day.